Okay, and now it is time for our next panel, Connecting Everyone, Everywhere, All the Time, What Could Go Wrong? And this will be moderated by Charles Isbell. So good afternoon, everyone. I think it's afternoon. Is it afternoon? Good morning, everyone. Um, is, uh, uh, my name is Charles Isbell. I'm the John P. M. Lee Jr. Dean of the College of Computing at Georgia Tech. I'd like to welcome all of you here, and I'd like to welcome all of my panelists for connecting everyone everywhere all at once. Um, and I hope that we're going to have a great conversation. So I'd like to see lots of fighting and screaming and interrupting <laughs> with one another and some really good questions uh, from the audience. Um, I'm not going to introduce our panelists, I'm going to let them do it themselves to, to hide the fact that I can't pronounce everyone's name correctly, uh, but let me just sort of set everything up uh, before, we, before we dive in. So it's been a good 75 years, I think, for computing all told. Um, we've seen amazing growth uh, in both the adoption and the impact of computing, certainly uh, in the last decade with a lot of the things that have been talked about uh, already this morning. Uh, we can see that in the devices that surround us, even the fact that this celebration is being simultaneously broadcast over the internet is actually a a pretty stunning achievement when you think about it. Um, we can see it in the transformation of our economy. In 2007, the top five companies by market cap were PetroChina, ExxonMobil, General Electric, China Mobile, and the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China. By 2017, they were Apple, Alphabet, Microsoft, Amazon, and Facebook. That's an amazing turnaround um, in less than a decade. We can also see it in the explosion of interest in being trained in computing. Across all of our universities, uh, both small and large, we've seen both our majors and I think importantly non-majors uh, grow, uh, not just the largest in our own histories, but often at the largest in the university. At, at Georgia Tech, for example, computer science is now 30% of all applications. In fact, this year we received more applications just for computer science than all of Georgia Tech did less than uh, 10 years ago. Um, I'm seeing things tweeted every day about this, this sort of thing. And more importantly, we can see it in the sort of connections that we've seen, the data uh, that we've gathered, which has sort of been the focus of, of the last panel, um, that sort of casually brings together billions of people, but I, I think with more than casual effects. I just want to point out one thing before we dive into the questions. Listening at the, the other panels that we've heard so far this morning, and when I think about the panels that are coming, it strikes me that at bottom, as computationalists, we've spent the bulk of our history arguing and trying to convince everybody uh, that our field is actually important. And we don't really have to do that anymore. We won that argument. Now we have to deal with the consequences of having been right. And I think really that's what this panel and what all the, what in fact this entire today is about. So with that, that context in mind, I want to ask each of you in turn uh, to tell me a little bit about yourselves. So this is your, your chance to introduce yourselves and to pronounce your, your names correctly. Um, and tell me sort of how your interests have changed over the context of your career during this very sudden, dare I say, you know, big O of two to the N uh, growth in the availability of computing, data, devices, and our underlying ability to connect with one another. So Duncan, I'll start with you. Oh, thanks, Charles. Yeah, so I, I, your, your choice of, of time period uh, of 2007 to 2017 is, is sort of uh, you know, particularly uh, salient for me because I was, uh, you know, at, in, in 2007, I was, I was uh, still at Columbia uh, teaching in the sociology department. And, you know, the previous 10 years of my work had been, uh, you know, dominated by, you know, the sort of stuff that we could do in the late 1990s, which was, you know, sort of toy models and, and, uh, and you know, computer simulations and trying to sort of explore dynamics of, of complex systems on networks and things like that. But as I was, uh, you know, sort of uh, going through the early to mid 2000s, uh, of course, I was aware of you know, the changes that were happening in the outside world. And so that was really the period where we transitioned from what people used to call Web 1.0 to Web 2.0. And so 1.0, roughly speaking, was, you know, people, uh, you know, some people put things up online on the, on the web and other people went and consumed those documents. And we used to talk about surfing the web and, and sort of, you know, going from one document to another. And so it was really about people interacting with static content. Uh, and then, 
this transition happened sort of in the early to mid 2000s where uh, a bunch of different types of services like online dating or, or um, uh, social networks, uh, early social media companies were uh, e-commerce companies were becoming more and more popular where the web increasingly became a place where people interacted with each other and started to perform the types of social and economic activities that had uh, previously happened in, in an offline analog manner in an online digital manner. And so this was a, you know, clearly a revolution that was happening uh, in the world and there was a lot of discussion at the time about what this meant uh, and how this would affect uh, you know, how we behaved and, and our sort of notions of privacy and intellectual property and all of these sorts of other controversies that are still raging. Um, but, you know, in my sort of seat at Columbia in a sociology department, I was thinking, you know, wait a minute, this is also uh, generating a tremendous amount of data in the course of people doing these other things that is of direct interest to the kinds of questions that I care about and that sociologists have cared about for, for, for decades. Um, but we don't we don't have the tools uh, to deal with this, uh, with this, uh, you know, with this style of data, with the scale of data. Uh, and it occurred to me at that time that that, that sociology and possibly the social sciences in general uh, were going to become computationalized or become computational, much as biology had in the in the early 1990s, and that this was going to be a, a sort of revolution, a scientific revolution. And uh, you know. At the time, I couldn't really participate in that where I was, and so I left and I went to Yahoo, and then I went to, uh, uh, to Microsoft uh, and spent 12 years working in industry because at the time, industry was somewhat ahead of academia in terms of recognizing these trends and, and trying to deal with them um, and bringing together computer scientists and social scientists to think about them. Um, but of course, you know, those 12 years later have uh, a lot changed in the academic world and now computational social science is a, is a vibrant uh, discipline and we have great conferences and, uh, and, and research labs uh, at many universities uh, uh, as well as in, in industry. Uh, and so, you know, in the last three years ago I went back to academia, so now I'm at, at, the, at the University of Pennsylvania and building a computational social science lab there. So, so this sort of transition uh, that you talked about has been very personal for me uh, and also very exciting because, uh, you know, we've been able to witness and participate in uh, this, this sort of really, uh, you know, quite distinct uh, uh, change in what's possible in the social sciences and uh, the, this sort of uh, increasing integration of computational thinking with, uh, with social science thinking. So it's a very sort of exciting period of time, uh, although we'll get to the challenges and what we uh, still need to be doing later on in this panel, uh, it's a very exciting uh, time to be doing this. So, so before we move to the next person, let me ask you a quick, quick question with that. So uh, the way you describe it, I think people in the audience might decide that computation affected social science, the social sciences. Mm -hmm. the social sciences affected computing? Well, I think that's a great question, and I think early on it, it, it was exactly as you say, that uh, it was, uh, you know, uh, people in the social sciences said, oh, we need computer scientists to come help us with our stuff. And uh, so it was very much a, 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 you know, sort of a kind of consulting model. Bring your methods, bring your, bring your, your knowledge of, of, of data to come and help us. Um, but as we, as was, you know, I think beautifully discussed in the previous panel, uh, you know, another transition that has happened over the last several years has been, uh, you know, we, you know, we, the computer scientists, the engineers, built these sort of massive scale systems as if they were just engineering systems uh, and we only needed engineers to think about them. We put them out there in the world and they sort of didn't do exactly what we hoped they would do, right? They did some of the things that we hoped they would do, but they did a lot of other things that we never thought about. And so now I think there's much more of a kind of reciprocation of interest uh, where, uh, you know, the understanding is these are, these are socio-technical systems. You know, you can't, uh, you know, you can't sort of think through any, uh, uh, you know, you can't deploy any system just by sitting and thinking about it carefully or designing algorithms carefully. As soon as it gets out there in the world, all kinds of other stuff is happening with incentives and with strategic behavior. Um, and so, you know, uh, I think now it's much more of a sort of equal-sided conversation. So. Uh, Thanks, Charles. Uh, my name is Anand Day, and I'm Dean of the Information School at the University of Washington. Um, and much of my research has focused on ubiquitous computing. I really grew up sort of in that Wyserian era of thinking about what would the world be like if computing were embedded everywhere, um, but mixed with a really uh, solid basis in human-computer interaction. So really thinking about things from a human perspective. Um, and the early days of UbiComp, 
the technology that we had available to us was incredibly impoverished. The uh, computation wasn't there, the sensing wasn't there, and if it, uh, the data wasn't there. And if it was available, it came at an incredible cost, either human cost or financial cost. Um, and so we had a lot of questions that we wanted to be able to answer about, mostly about human behavior, trying to understand human intent. But it, they weren't, you just couldn't answer those in those days. Um, you know, you were really limited to what people, the kind of data you could collect were, uh, context about, you know, somebody swiping, their, swiping a, a proximity card uh, to be able to tell that they were in a particular location. So the kind of data that we wanted to be able to use and the questions we wanted to be able to answer, oh, this person has this set of interests or this focus, so we'll let's provide them some services to support them, really couldn't answer them without a lot of human effort. Um, today, it's obviously a very different world. Today, my work focuses still on trying to model people's uh, human behavior at a, a you know, medium scale, I would say, um, and using these models to detect uh, and predict outcomes of interest. Now we can answer some of those questions we were trying to answer 20 years ago. Uh, I, I leave it to you whether it's, it's a good thing that we can answer these questions or not. Um, you know, in those early days, because the, the data was so hard to collect, a lot of the research that was happening at that time was really focused on the infrastructure. How do we collect minuscule amounts of data? How do we reuse that data over time so that when we can finally start collecting it en masse, we have the technology or the infrastructure to be able to do that. And now, um, you know, the state of the art at that time was very simple location-based services. And now, you know, we all carry around devices that ha can do so much more than we ever imagined. Um, so, you know, fast forward 20-something years, and a lot of these problems don't exist anymore that we, that we had to deal with. Uh, we co the commodity devices that are available, whether it's these smartphones, smart watches, Internet of Things devices, smart speakers, um, they have sensing, computation, collect data, really intimate, personal data about all of us uh, to a degree that we, you know, we've just never experienced before. Um, and you can do some really interesting things with it. I would say in, in my research group, we focused a lot on uh, issues of healthcare. So you know, we took a $3 pillbox and instrumented it with some pretty rudimentary sensors. You can tell what day of the week it's opened. You can tell how many pills have been taken out. Some pretty simple sensors, deployed it to an elder, uh, a senior living center. And from that, from their interactions with that pillbox, you can detect whether an elder is undergoing cognitive decline. Since then, we've been looking at, my group has primarily been looking at um, college students. Uh, we collected you know, two years of data from my time at Carnegie Mellon, another five years now. Actually, today is the last day of our study at uh, the University of Washington. So five years of data at the University of Washington, looking at behaviors of college students as captured by you know, an, a wearable fat fitness tracker, and a smartphone. And we can do things that I think are interesting, things that uh, policymakers at the universities think are interesting. So things like um, being able to detect or predict that some a, a college student's going to exhibit depressive symptoms at the end of an academic term. Using one week of data from the very beginning of a term to be able to predict the student's out, uh, ending GPA at that term. Looking at um, uh, identifying that a student has been in, uh, has been discriminated against in some way, and looking at how their changes in behavior actually allow us to understand that. You know, early in my career, I couldn't have imagined being able to do any of that. I mean, that was part of my wish list that I wanted to be able to work on these things. But early in my career, none of that was possible. Now the sensing, computation, data, it's all there. Uh, and it's all sitting in our pockets, which I find to be really quite remarkable. So you know, as these kinds of devices continue to proliferate, it brings along a lot, uh, some really exciting opportunities but it also brings along some pretty challenges, uh, important challenges. Well, I, I can't wait to hear about those, but uh, I'll, I'll let you go first. Uh, good, so uh, my name is uh, Yuri Leskovec and uh, a uh, professor at Stanford. Um, so I come to this from, I would say, uh, kind of big data machine learning point of view. And when I started uh, uh, my research career, I was really fascinated by, I think it was a quote from Jim Gray that uh, the development of the web is like discovery of the new continent. So, so early on, right, it was really this fascination that through the web, through this, um, you know, and then social media and so on, we are able to observe almost like with a, we are, a, 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 how to say, um, behaviors of large, large numbers of people to a very fine detail, right? And we are almost like given a new telescope with which we can kind of observe and quantify uh, uh, behavior of humanity. And I was very, fascinated by that uh, and, and have, have read a lot of um, 
kind of fundamental social social science literature and really say, can I repeat, in some sense repeat or redo those experiments at a much larger scale? And we did a study around six degrees of separation using Microsoft Instant Messenger. Um, we did a lot of studies around how um, information spreads and, uh, and virality, evolution of social networks, um, and so on. And that was very interesting because kind of it, it allowed us to really measure, quantify uh, behaviors in these systems and then, try, and, and then trying, to, trying to understand it. At the, at the same time, kind of as, as that, I would say that understanding of the behavior of, of um, users, of humans in those systems improved, I think what also happened is that the, the, the scope of that uh, spread uh, more towards, let's say, consumption of the news and trying to understand the dynamics of the news cycle, all the way, for example, today using uh, cell phone data um, to both understand people's health and physical mobility all over the planet or be very accurate at modeling the spread of COVID and understanding uh, why, for example, um, soci so socioeconomically disadvantaged group uh, get hit by COVID uh, uh, harder. So this is how, how I came to this. I also um, spent seven years as, as chief scientist at Pinterest, where basically based on, based on those learnings of understanding the, the behaviors, then tried to do the right thing and build personalization recommender systems um, that help uh, people use, let's say, Pinterest as a social visual discovery, uh, discovery website. Um, so that's quickly about where I come from and how I come into this story. Thank you. Thank you. Charles. So it's, um, you hear me? Yeah, great. So it's a pleasure to be here. I'm uh, Yoel Marek. Um, I'm today, I act as a, a vice president of research for uh, Alexa Shopping at Amazon. And if I want to introduce myself, I think I'm a search dinosaur. Uh, as compared to, to many people in the field. So I started my career um, basically at IBM Research just after I got my PhD in information retrieval. And at the time, uh, so I think my first paper in search was in 89 at an ACM conference, the CIR conference. And at the time, you know, when I went to IBM, I, I built a search engine. It was for enterprise search. And then nobody cared about it, of course, because you know IBM it was a database company. So we were saying, you know, before we had to convince everyone that uh, you know computing was important. At the time, it was trying to convince everyone that you know search was important. And honestly, nobody cared. But you know, had a lot of fun in it. So I worked on that for uh, for about 17 years, and then the the web happened. And suddenly, what we were doing in you know, our small labs and trying to publish paper in the community started to be interesting to everyone. And for instance, you know, one of my key uh, uh, you know, mottos was to try to convince everyone at IBM that a Boolean query is not natural to humans because people, you know, humans don't speak Boolean and they should speak like free text. And then you know, Google happened and it worked and I didn't have to do anything anymore, which was really a pleasure. And that's when I went to Google, right, to do something a little bit uh, new. So then it was trying to try to, um, to change the world of queries, because I loved, you know, free text queries, but the, the 10 blue links and the text box had been kind of stuck for a quite, a, quite a long time. And so at Google, you know, my, the claim for fame on my team was Google Suggest. When we started to, you know, you, you all use it, right? You start to enter your query, it's automatically completed. Uh, seems obvious today. It was not that obvious to do it first at the time. Um, and so it was really a lot of fun, but it was like more engineering. And then I moved to, um, to Yahoo. So from web search to, to Yahoo. And by the way, Yahoo actually had uh, the search completion launch before Google. So I had a lot of respect for, for Yahoo where I did uh, meet uh, Duncan at the time. Um, and at Yahoo, I, I tried to look at other aspects of search. So it, now it was about communicating connecting with people is the, is the topic of this panel. It was about mail search. And we realized that actually people don't use mail as you, we thought. And actually the most of 90% actually of the, the web mail traffic, not the enterprise mail, but the web mail traffic was all about machine generated email. It was not people talking to each other. It was really like companies and enterprise, you're just talking to, to, to us, right? So that was a big discovery for us. Um, you know, happened to Yahoo, what happened to Yahoo? <laughs> and then at, uh, about five years ago, I moved to, uh, to Amazon. And there I looked, you know, I, I still wanted to be in search, right? I've been in search for like 30 years, but I love search in different incarnations. 
And then suddenly I said, you know, what could be the most difficult in search? And there are two things that really attract me, attracted me to Amazon. The, the first one that if you look at search when people want to look for products, something I do remember from my, my Google days, it's complicated, right? It's a semi-structure search and, and there is a stake. It's not like information search, right? If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But you know, when you do try to do product search and you don't find the thing that you want to buy, uh, you're super upset. So the, you know, the customers are not users anymore. The customers start being very upset if the precision is not excellent. And to make it even more complicated, it's not only product search, but it's voice search because you know I joined Alexa shopping, so it was really trying to do search, you know, with my eye closed and my hand tie, so that of course you know I, I love a good challenge. So that's when I, I you know, that's why I went to, to Amazon. And and when you talk about shopping by voice, it's not just buying stuff, right? If it's really about ambient computing. If you think about it. When you have an Alexa device or any kind of, uh, of search devices at home, uh, it's not the you know early Siri thing when you talk to your to your mobile phone. It's really having this assistant in your home, always here, and listening to you when you need it to, to do the right thing for you. And it's super it's super interesting for me at least as a as a researcher, where it's not only again about buying, but it's really about everything that goes around shopping, right? It's inquiring, exploring, building my shopping list. Uh, at the end, I could do a transaction, but I get also proactive notifications, which is really cool. So the, the, the challenges on the machine are like incredible. And the, my expectation as a user, as a customer, is even higher. And, and for me, that's really the, this kind of future where we have this assistant at home always here. And because it's always here, it's ambient, it better be super, super right all the time because otherwise I'm going to be super upset. So that's what I'm doing these days. So I want to follow up on the idea of, of, of ambient search, but I do, I do want to put like one little correction in there, which I think you know, people do speak in Boolean, or at least my teenagers do. They've got the no part down perfectly. <laughs> um, so if we think about this sort of ambient search question, right, it's, it strikes me that this requires an, uh, a lot of understanding of conversations coming from the system, yes, but also understanding by the humans who are interacting with the system and, um, and by the designers of the system to think very carefully. So this has come up already on this panel and it's come up on at least the last one about really engineering systems going beyond the engineer and, and understanding what the, the people need. I would say James Mickens in his comments earlier today implicitly made this criticism. The entire panel last time was explicitly this criticism that we tend to avoid thinking about humans as much as possible uh, when we build our systems, but not one person today has said anything other than human beings are at the center of the, the things we're building. So when you build these kind of search things, these amb this, particularly in the, the ambient space where you're, you're embedded in a, another human being's uh, personal and, and social, social space, how do you think about that? How do you yeah. bring together groups of people so that you actually ensure that the system you're building is responding to the human? Yeah, that's what I say. It's, it's right on the spot. So. That's something I, I discovered when I, I came to Amazon. You know, I thought in previous companies, and that was one of the reasons you know, that I really enjoyed moving from enterprise to kind of user-facing system at, uh, systems at, at Google, at Yahoo. And th but then when I went to, to Amazon, I discovered this, uh, maybe you heard about this, they, they call that uh, a leadership principle, which is called customer obsession, something that comes from, from Jeff Bezos. And basically, customer obsession, when you say obsession and not centric, it means that it's almost a sickness. It's being obsessed. Try to always start from the customer and build your, your, your solution backwards. So you know, Bezos envisioned that really for the entire company and the flyway of the company. But when I joined, and I joined the, the, the science leadership team of the team, I, I tried to move that to science. What does that mean to do customer obsessed science? So, OK, you know, I want to be consistent with Amazon. I'm not going to be technology for the sake of it. I'm going to start from a real user problem and work something backward. OK, that's, so that's for the motivation. But I, I, what I, I'm trying to urge my teams to do you know, across the world is to go even further. Don't try simply to say, OK, I'm customer obsessed. What do I do for the customer? I don't do science for the sake of it. I'm not just buying, you know, building a cool system. And then if there are users or you know, monetization, excellent. I'm really starting from a pain point or maybe for a future need. But go further than that. Even your solution should be actually inspired and driven by the, by the users. And the solution should be driven backwards. Start from that. 
but don't only start, you know, and if I think of Google Suggest, right, the reason for which Google Suggest worked so well, because you're all using it, it's basically because we tried from query logs. I had something like that at IBM doing query completion, but it started from documents, so we were not speaking the right language. When Google Suggest starts from query logs, you speak the right language, and then basically the users can relate to it. So now take that to ambient search. Start from a real customer, try to understand their language, but don't then disconnect and go all the way and do your own stuff, because that would be wrong. That would be super pretentious. And if, you know, I can, I always give that, uh, you know, that advice to, to younger scientists, be humble, because you know nothing, right? Jon Snow, you know nothing. It's all about really listening to, the, to what the customer really needs at every step. And to give you a, a recent example that we had, so, you know, we thought we would build like very, very cool interactions and we would do what the customer wants when they search, when they build a shopping list, when we do, we do even conversation, right? We have this uh, task boat in the Alexa Prize competition for students, for academic students, and they build full conversation to carry a task over multiple days. Really cool, but don't, you, you never know what the customer is going to do. And one of the things we, we discovered that actually users play with machines. So that's uh, actually my, my, one of my favorite pet projects. We, you know, we were talking about Turing earlier today, and one of the biggest AI challenges is computational humor. What we discovered is that actually users play with Alexa, even when they shop. So they would come to Alexa, and they, they call that what's called the you know, superiority humor, and they say, Alexa, buy me a brain, or buy my spouse a brain. And they really do that, right? And if I put a brain in your shopping list, you're going to make fun of Alexa because you feel this superiority about the robot, right? So now, you know, the big challenge that we said is, okay, you know, Alexa, buy me a Lamborghini. Alexa, you know, turn off the moon because it's bothering me, right? And it's, it's actually a recent, uh, because it's just on my face, right? And users are so unexpected. And now our, our, our role here is to be, to listen, to understand what they need. And what we are trying now is to try to answer we call that these playful requests and try to answer them in a playful way. But we have to be super careful because if they were not joking, right? If a customer is asking for adult diapers, you're going diapers, you're going to say, oh, it's incongruity, diapers are not for adults, or oh, actually they might be. So you better be sure to, that you're right in your models if you make a funny answer or a playful answer to a serious request. So what I'm saying here, Humility, listen, iterate all the time, and just learn. Because it's like, a, just to conclude that, you know, it's, it's like a dance. I think Kevin was saying, was saying that in the previous panel. Everything about machines and humans is a dance. You know, we listen to, to humans, we with the machine. The machine listen to humans. The humans adapt to us, they change the way they interact, and together we're converging to, to, together to something. I'm not looking at you know, what Wendy was saying, it's not a matrix, I think machines and humans need to evolve together to basically to bring the most value to humanity and to humans at the end. So it does occur to me that you know, dancers are trained, right? So I'm wondering if it's by the time they get to Amazon it's too late. So uh, do any of the professors or maybe a dean of an information school somewhere in the Pacific Northwest want to you know, make a comment on what our role is in teaching young people how to think this way um, beyond just whatever it is that we do in the curriculum with engineering and computer science and whatever else is that we're teaching? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I first, you said you wanted us to fight a little bit, so I want to take a little bit of umbrage about uh, the idea that um, including humans in computing is a new thing, right? One of the largest special interest, and I don't think that's exactly what you said, but that's what I'm taking from it. Um, <laughs> one of the largest special interest groups in the ACM is SIGCHI, which you know, for 30 plus years, 40 plus years, has been focused exactly on uh, the role of humans in computing, whether it's on uh, programming or as end users, but thinking about how to do co-design and co-development with, co with them and not treating them just as end users. Uh, and I think that's just really critical to think about, particularly as uh, we start to think about how to co-develop or co-design AI systems or to do this, to do this uh, dance that we've just been talking about. Um, as far as our students go, uh, I think you know, we've done them a real disservice by teaching them only the technologies 
and not teaching enough about the ethics and uh, fairness and other issues, this, the social impact of the kinds of de decisions that they may be making, either in their research as, as PhD graduate students or the kinds of systems that they might be building when they go out to industry. Um, I would make a call out to ACM as a whole that uh, that absolutely has to be integrated <coughs> into um, standard computer science curriculum. And it is happening at some places, I think, you know, I, 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 t I'm pretty new to an information school, but I will say information schools are have somewhat taken the lead on um, in this aspect uh, of trying to understand not just the technologies that are being produced, but certainly uh, the impact of those technologies on society. So speaking of society, uh, Yuri, I want, I want to ask you, ask you this one. Um, you know, a lot of the work that's been done, as you point out, going, going far back has been at the, the level of the personal, right? Building things at the level of uh, sort of what individuals need. But what happens when we ask questions about the impact of technology, uh, a level removed, you know? What are terrorists, we have terror scale networks now, uh, they can be used to drive public policy. They can, or at least public policy, public policy level responses. So what is this sort of newfound, everyone connected to everything in the world all the time mean about our approaches to solving humanitarian crises, for example, or, or problems that affect all of us as groups? I, I think it's, you know, kind of overall, I think we can be so excited about the, the expansion of the scope of what computing or what computer science, computer science is. And, and we as a discipline are relevant in so many different uh, places, disciplines, applications, and so on. And of course, through, through, through that, uh, uh, how, how to say, increased breadth of what we are doing, we have, we have issues, we, we, need, we, need, we need to learn how to go beyond technology and so on. But at, at the same time, um, working with in interesting large-scale large data brings in so many of the core kind of computing fundamental questions uh, uh, to light and also requires development of new methods um, and new algorithms. So what we've been mostly recently um, excited about is to take this kind of um, viewpoint of a telescope, not just point it to the web and to the social media, but kind of point it, uh, point it more broadly and say, how can, how can computing, how can you know, data science, um, machine learning uh, help in, in making, let's say, high stakes, uh, high stakes decisions or understanding the, wor the world around us. Uh, one, one, of, one of the studies we did was uh, using cell phone data uh, from um, 100 million um, uh, Americans. Um, and uh, this was the study about trying to understand how, how people are dynamically in contact with, uh, who's in contact with whom, and trying to accurately model the spread of the, of, of the COVID virus, right? And, uh, we were able, for example, to show and explain um, how or model um, reopening policies, right? What would happen if I reopen these places at this level of uh, capacity? How, how, is the, how, how, is, how is the society or how is the virus going to react? Why are, I mentioned earlier a bit, you know, why are um, uh, economically, socioeconomically disadvantaged group more hit by the virus? It turns out because they couldn't reduce their mobility they went to places where the density of people was twice as big as, as, as where, let's say, high-income high people went and they spent their, uh, they were there twice as long, right? So you get all these interesting insights uh, from these kinds of uh, large-scale data and, and then in, um, in collaboration with uh, uh, policymakers, try to make uh, better decisions, right? And through this work, we, we were able to touch hundreds of millions of people you know, the U.S. Supreme Court is referring to our paper. Um, it was on kind of uh, the graphs from the paper were on na national televisions in Japan, in Poland, and so on. But it was all, in a sense, a set of kind of an interdisciplinary team of computer scientists and social scientists, and, and a lot of kind of computing expertise, large-scale data analysis ex expertise, a lot of statistical data modeling expertise um, to be able to do things like that. So. I think there is still huge amounts uh, of opportunity out there for us to, to kind of harness this uh, con connected, connected world uh, for the good. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow in that and uh, to decide that you said something you didn't say. So I'm going to decide that what you said is that we <laughs> need uh, to be able to measure data nearly perfectly to have the kind of impact we want to have, or at least that there must be consequences if we don't. So, so Duncan. Talk to me about measurement and what we can do and what we can't do and what it means. 
Well, let me, let me uh, refer back to Yuri's uh, uh, metaphor of the telescope, which is a wonderful metaphor, and I have used it uh, myself many times. Um, but it, it is flawed in a very important way, uh, namely that uh, telescopes are designed specifically to measure the thing that you're interested in, right? So it is a, it is a you know, first you start with the objective, you want, to, uh, you, know, you want to observe light of a certain type of frequency, you want it to have certain properties, so you build the, the device to, to, to satisfy the properties that, uh, of, the, of the data that you want to collect. Um, for the, the kinds of data that we've been talking about today, it's a completely different system where somebody builds, uh, you know, so uh, Yuri's example of the of the, the cell phone data, you know, there are uh, there's a whole industry of companies uh, that uh, that uh, you know that that aggregate data from uh, from third party apps uh, in some way that nobody understands, uh, and uh, and they use the data. Uh, to sell ads uh, uh, that they push to people's devices, so that you know if you're walking past the Dunkin' Donuts, uh, you might get an ad for uh, you know for 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 coffee or something, right? And so uh, you know then that data gets handed over to the research community in a, in a sort of uh, you know in a in some sort of um, you know in, in in the case two years ago where suddenly it became clear that that sort of data might also be useful for modeling COVID. Um, and is now being used for a totally different purpose, right? And, and you have a, a whole set of concerns about representativeness and like a bias and coverage uh, that you care about as a researcher uh, that these companies don't need to care about at all. Uh, and so uh, this is not a small problem, this is a huge problem. Uh, and you know, I think every single experience I've ever had getting data from some, whether it's email data or cell phone data or, um, or panel data or, um, uh, or um, you know any 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 data at all that comes from some system that was not designed to answer the research question of interest, you you have this uh, uh, you know uh, very significant problem that you have to deal with that the data is 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 it's not like the telescope right the data is not actually answering the question that you the researcher care about, and so you know what should we do about that? I mean you know I think one thing you can do is spend an enormous amount of time cleaning data and you know combining it with other sorts of data sets and, and dealing with these sort of noise and bias issues uh, and trying to fix it. And that's something that we spend a lot of time doing. And I know Yuri spends a lot of time doing. Um, uh, but you know, an alternative path is to sort of take the telescope metaphor seriously and say, look, if we really care about these questions, right? if these are really sort of existential societal questions that we, that we say they are, maybe we actually have to build our own infrastructure and our own devices that measure the thing that we're actually interested in, right? Um, and that could get very expensive, and maybe it's impossible. But it's a it's a totally different. Um, I mean, it's not a completely unfamiliar model to the social sciences. We do have these sort of uh, we do have these big surveys, right? There's sort of the uh, the A and S survey, the election survey, the general social survey. So there are these sort of big um, uh, survey. Uh, uh, surveys that have been running for, for decades uh, that are funded by the National Science Foundation and that have produced you know, lots of, of, of useful social science research. But in general, we don't have the, the, the type of you know, community-wide investment in sort of very expensive pieces of infrastructure that uh, then benefit thousands of researchers uh, who are interested in, in uh, you know, some sort of class of questions. And, and so that would be, you know, I think, uh, you know, that would be, a, a, that, that I think is a big challenge for the computational social science community right now is like, how do we kind of come up with, uh, how do we frame questions in such a way that we can, uh, that we can generate the kind of investment that would allow us to build the kind of infrastructure that could really answer these, these questions. Can, can I be provocative here, Duncan? Sure. Because you said, you asked us, Charles, to be provocative. Because you say here that you have the data and you know, we, should, we the scientists should frame the question. But how do you know that the right question, right? Because the user is not, or the customer, they are not part of the, of the formalization, for, formalization of the question. So how is it user-centric if you, the designer, the scientist, are asking the question? I, I think I totally agree with your okay. with your perspective, and in fact, I you know I have sort of written you know papers about you know s you know social science should be more solution I call it solution oriented. We should think more about the problem that we're trying to solve and work backwards from there. And I would say that's totally consistent with uh, uh, with the um, you know with the the framework that I was just advocating for, right? And so, but I you know 
what is the problem, right? That is exactly you know, where we should start from. And I agree with you that it's not something that we should just sort of cook up uh, from theory, but rather that we should be you know, actively engaged you know, with communities, for example, that are affected, or you know, alternatively, actively engaging with, with, with tech companies and other kinds of companies uh, who are you know, essentially where the rubber meets the road in terms of you know, problems like misinformation and polarization and you know, pr consumption of information. So I think you know, mm -hmm. that's another related problem, which is that we tend to, you know, the academic and, uh, worlds and industry tend to be, you know, even after all of this time and even after tens of thousands of papers have been written you know, using Twitter uh, data, um, we are not, you know, we do not have good ways of sharing uh, problems and data across the sort of academic industry divide, and there is a profound lack of trust and understanding. Of course, you know, having been on both sides of, of this divide, I think there is a profound lack of trust and understanding between these two communities, uh, and that is another area where I think we have a lot of work and big challenges to try to to address. But exactly, sort of getting to this sort of what are we trying to actually accomplish, and who is it benefiting? Is exactly the place to start. So actually, so let, let me. Ask, so what is the? I think Yuri wants to get in, but let me ask you. This. So what? What are we doing, right? So if the sort of pithy critique of psychology is that it's the study of 18-year-olds who happen to be going to college and are hungry enough that they're motivated to get $15, what are we doing? Like, what's the pithy description of what we're doing? We're what? The study of Twitter because that's because Twitter gave us an API. I mean, what's the? Uh, well. Mm. I'm, I know I can I can I can try to match that right. So uh, <laughs> uh, I think you know what are what are we let's say from the from from this point of view? It would be we collect some data, measure it, and, and report, and we behave as if uh, it's the universal truth that was uh, <laughs> done with a you know properly calibrated telescope. And I well. think what Duncan is what Duncan is nicely saying is, which I think is exciting and 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 uh, calls for new research. Is right that the data that we have is kind of passively collected, as for example, Sand Sandil said, right? And the, the purpose for what the data was collected and the, the purpose for what the data is being used, there might be a disconnect. So doing reliable statistical inferences is so much more, uh, so much more challenging and so much more nuanced. And a mistake is to say, oh, we just collected something measured, here's the truth. I think I would go one step further and say that, again, to try and use this telescope metaphor, I'm trying to figure out if the, we have broken telescopes or the metaphor is broken. I'm not sure which it is. <laughs> uh, because it implies that we know where to point the telescope and, or that we can calibrate the telescope correctly. But for so many of the things we want to collect data about, um, even as humans, we don't know what it is that uh, we want to aim this telescope at. Like, what kinds of data would tell me what each of you are thinking or what you're interested in at this very moment so that we could provide some service that may or may not be of use to you um, as you're walking by your Dunkin' Donuts? And so um, the idea that we could get to a truth about uh, what, how to even build that telescope, I, I, I find that just to be, uh, I think you said it, 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 it might be impossible, but I find it problematic, problematic at best. And that means that the inferences that we make with our causal inferencing systems to, to have some outcome of, uh, uh, that, we, that we care about, um, they're inherently going to be challenged, right? They're inherently going to fail in a, in a significant number of cases, and those, some of those cases, you know, in some, in some situations like whether it's recommendations or something else, maybe that's okay. But in some other cases where you're talking about healthcare or uh, other really uh, uh, critical issues, we, may, we, can't, we just can't take that chance. Can I just jump in? Uh, so I think one, just let me give a plug for, for, for description, right? So I, I think you know, descriptive research is, uh, is, I think, historically undervalued mm -hmm. in, at least in the social sciences and maybe across all the sciences. I think Rutherford described it as you know, stamp collecting. Um, uh, and it seems like, you know, it, it does seem like a sort of second class activity. But I think that, you know, one thing we should be doing more in computational social science is elevating description to a first class scientific activity. And let me give you an example. So everybody uh, who hasn't been living in a cave for the last five years sort of knows that we're drowning in a sea of misinformation and fake news, right? Um, and so there's lots of proposals out there. Many people think they have solutions for it. Um, but if you sort of actually think carefully about the problem, it's you know, immensely complex, right? People get information from all sorts of sources. 
sources, from television, from social media, from, from regular media, from their, from their mobile devices, from their desktops. So we're sort of living in an in incredibly fragmented world where people are uh, absorbing different types of information in different ways and all of that information is compromised in various sort of subtle ways. Um, and it's totally unclear actually like what the problem is, right? So we have this tendency to sort of think about problems like this and say, okay, let's go try to solve it. But I would suggest that we can't actually solve any of these problems until we have a better understanding of what the problem is. And that brings us back to descriptive uh, work, to, to be able to say, look, let's try to get a better uh, understanding of the state of the world, which means building all of this sort of very expensive and complicated infrastructure which combines data from all of these different sources. And that itself is an enormous challenge. And of course, as you suggest, even if we did all that, we might still not know what's going on. But I think that that, that is sort of a place to start, is to say, let us, let us sort of elevate description to a first class activity and say, let's have a better descriptive understanding. Let's try to at least build this telescope and see what uh, is out there before we start rushing towards uh, solving the problem. So it's worth pointing out, so we now have questions. We have questions from the audience, and according to that, we only have a few seconds left. According to my iPad, uh, we have a few minutes left, so I'm going to listen to my iPad uh, before we let everyone go to lunch. Um, by the way, I have an announcement about lunch, so don't leave until after, after I, I, I tell you about it. So g getting to the, um, to the telescope metaphor, which is now my favorite metaphor, and I will use it in my everyday conversations. Um, Telescopes are good, right? Because they let you look at the stars. You say they were designed specifically because we knew the question we wanted to answer. On the other hand, it turns out if you take the telescope and point it this way, you can look into someone's house and you can do other things with it besides what, what was intended, um, I, I'm sure, other than what was intended. So here's a question from the audience. So I have devices that are always on and listening to everything I say. Uh, when will they detect when I am dangerous um, and inform the police? And what happens when they're wrong? So we're building all of these things that connect everyone together, ostensibly for things I may or may not find useful, but presumably also are being used by other people uh, for other reasons. So take that where you will, but they what already, happens when that happens? Or they, is it already happening? They already do. Um, just, uh, just this week, there was an announcement um, by uh, the Oregon Department of Human Services that they're going to stop using this algorithm uh, that was based on a population level data, but uh, data that would uh, tell people, tell their, their social workers uh, which p families were at risk for abuse or, um, I can't remember what else it was, but it was a, certainly uh, uh, child abuse. And this is being used in, by counties and states across the United States. Uh, they finally, they realized to, to no one's surprise in this room, that the data that the systems are inherently biased, and they're picking people, out, families of color, out at a much higher proportion than uh, than, than white families, and so they decided to stop using. It. So I would say it's already out there. The, the genie's out of the whatever the right metaphor is. But, the cat's out of the bag. But let's hope also. You know, I think we have a tendency today because we are computer scientists to be super alarmist, right? It started with the Matrix metaphor, one of my favorite movies. But come on, you know, let, let's not look only at the negative side. There are so many beautiful things with technology and machines. The fact that there is this machine, you know, my, my mother, she's a, she's a widow, she's 86 year old, living alone at, you know, at home. She doesn't want any, she's super capable of doing everything, but she's worried. She's worried that she's, if she fails and her iPhone is not with her, how she's going to call me. And the fact that, you know, I put uh, an Alexa device speaking French in her, of, in, in her in our, actually in our small room, and then in our living room, and then for her to know that at any time she falls and she can call someone to help, there is beauty in it, right? So I agree we need to put this guardrail, we need to be, there is a lot of responsibilities, right, to do it right, because yes. it could go in a nightmarish scenario, but let's not forget the good things. You know, progress is good in some sense, people feel better. I would also, just in the, in the spirit of sort of balancing the alarmism, I think, you know, all of these concerns about, about bias and, uh, and, you know, adverse uh, consequences and, and bad training data and everything are totally valid and we should take them very seriously. Um, but I, I want to sort of bring a point actually that Sendall from the previous panel made in a, in a, in a paper a couple of years ago where they were, they, they were looking at um, medical decision making and found, you know, as you might guess, that, that there, there are sort of uh, unexpected correlations in the data that result in the, uh, the algorithm generating some, uh, some bad outcomes. Um, 
But the sort of unexpected twist at the end of the argument is that, uh, is that because it was an algorithmic decision-making system, it was actually uh, uh, you know, much easier to audit and they could figure out what mm -hmm. the problem was and then they could correct it. Right. Um, and so we talk about algorithms as being sort of inscrutable uh, and, 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 uh, and, and non-transparent and not understandable, but people are also inscrutable and, and not transparent <laughs> and not understandable. Everyone. And That's they right. also lie to you and they, and they lie That's to right. themselves. Right. Uh, and so this idea that we sort of understand people and we don't understand algorithms I think is totally wrong. We don't understand people, right? Correct. Um, and, That's and, a good one. And so in some ways, the upside of the algorithmic problems is that they're, they're, they're sort of surfacing these questions that have always been with us in ways, because they're inscribed in code, seem much more tangible to us. Um, and so I think a lot of the alarmism is that we're suddenly noticing problems in a way that we didn't notice them before. But it also gives us an opportunity to fix the problems and to ask ourselves, what are the solutions that we're trying to reach? Uh, and so I think we could sort of change this conversation around, around algorithms to be much more about like, you know, this is a problem, it's been, always been with us, here's an opportunity to do something constructive about it, what do we want to do rather than algorithms are bad, let's not use them. So I, I'm pretty sure you just demonstrated that we have actually passed the Turing test and that we have built computers that are as inscrutable as we are. So we're, we're more or less out of time. Um, I. Uh, I wanted to give each of you just like five seconds to, to, um, to tell me, to tell the audience what it is you really wish they got out of this panel. You only got five or 10 seconds a piece, so make it pithy and profound you're on camera. Whoever wants to go first, go. <laughs> Let's go with Yuri. Yuri uh, hasn't talked as much as others. No pressure. <laughs> okay, um, what to get out? I think, I think the following. Um, Algorithms are, are great, but they are, but are a very powerful tool um, because, because we can kind of, um, they make things explicit, which means they improve our understanding of phenomena. And many times we look at them in a, in a, in a, criti in a critical way because they kind of bring out the issues that, that we, di we did not fully understand before. And I think that's a great opportunity for us to further, to further improve and further um, improve the field and, you know, develop better methods, better approaches that may not be just better algorithms, but actually everything around it to make progress in, in decision making. Um, you know, like we were discussing uh, uh, algorithm, algorithmic decision making in, um, in medicine. Uh, what we find out that humans are trained on biased data sets. So human doctors are making more biased decisions than, than uh, algorithmic machi than machines are. Why, when you go back to the literature, you see their humans are trained on biased data sets. Uh, we worked on criminal court cases. Uh, interestingly, uh, uh, an algorithm that tries to imitate the judge does better than the judge themselves, which means that the judge is using private information that kind of throws the judge off, right? So the, all these kinds of issues become explicit. And, and that's, I think, kind of very interesting and allow us and gives us a way how to kind of, we can improve and make the next steps. Okay, I think we're going to unfortunately agree with each other. Technology is good. Technology is good uh, and, and we should stop being alarmist. We need to be careful. And the only thing to, to remember is to, to be humble. We don't know everything. We don't own the, 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 the definition of the problem, the definition of anything. We need to, invo to, to be super humble, listen, and adapt all the time. That's it. And, and stop panicking. Just be careful. I'm kind of contradicting myself, right? Don't panic. Be careful. Uh, I think we should. I think there's reason to be alarmist. I, I, I totally <laughs> take your, uh, your point that. Uh, I love technology. I'm the first, I'm the, probably the biggest technophile in, uh, here. Um, I think the power that it offers is, is huge. I, I, I still think that we still need to be that, we still need to be able to ring that bell to, so that we are paying attention to the right things. And I'll just end with, if you thought the last 75 years of computing was exciting, <laughs> wait till the next 75. Yeah. <laughs> nice. So I'll, I'll finish by talking about common sense. So, uh, so you know, common sense is you know, 50, 60 years old in, in uh, going back to McCarthy. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think at the time, people thought that the problem would be solved by now. And it is, it is sort of no more solved now than it was 50 years ago. And I think that that uh, illustrates a really important point, which is that because we're human and we experience um, being human, we think that it's, it's easy to explain. 
right? That we have this sort of, uh, you know, this sort of implicit, naive view that human behavior is something that we just know about because we do it all the time. Uh, and therefore, we should be able to teach it to computers. When we try to teach it to computers, we find that we can't do it. And I think the reason is we don't actually understand it at all. And so that, I think, if I could sort of you know, go back to your earlier comments about what you would be teaching our undergraduates, it should be like the stuff that you think is trivial right, is actually the hardest stuff of all. And part of what makes it hard is its perceived triviality. So you know, sort of, uh, you know, I wrote a book 10 years or so ago called Everything is Obvious Once You Know the Answer. And, uh, and it is sort of a useful framework for me to think about the kinds of explanations that we give of human behavior. Because in, if somebody does anything at all, you can always come up with an explanation after the fact for why they did that. That doesn't mean that you can predict it. That doesn't mean you can anticipate it. doesn't mean you can design it into algorithms. That is a totally different exercise. And I think if we could sort of get that in our heads, uh, we, would, we would have a better starting place. I think it's wonderful. So I'll just I'll answer my own question there. I'll just say, if I think of computing as being different from engineering, sciences, humanities, and everything, a, a different discipline, I think what distinguishes us is that we understand fundamentally, we grok, that models, languages, and machines are equivalent. And that is a big, major insight that, that the field has brought, brought, to, uh, brought to science and to, the, and to discovery. Um, but what we have been missing all along is that there's, that's a triangle, but there are people in the middle of that triangle, and it's the humans that, that make it all are relevant. And so most of the problems I think we've heard today, and I suspect we will hear in the, the panels that we've now preempted on humans and AI, uh, is that it's really a problem of invisibility. And that invisibility is not that you're in front of me and I don't see you. It's that you're not in front of me and I don't notice your absence. And so a lot of our problems come from not thinking hard about the things we haven't seen, not the things that we are explicitly trying to avoid. So with that, um, we're going to close the panel. But before we do, and before you applaud, and I expect lots of applause for our wonderful panel here, <laughs> uh, I have been asked to let you know that lunch follows this immediately, These for those of you who are here, and that it is upstairs. And the easiest way to get there is to take the escalator which is that way, um, follow the escalator up, follow the food, I will probably be in line. Uh, so there you go. So please join me in thanking our panelists and panelists join me in thanking our audience.